<laughs> it's simple, really. Great stories with a good cup of tea. It's the Tea with Mike show. Tea with Mike fans on uh, this episode of the show, uh, Gilbert Allen, um, film, uh, television uh, producer and actor, stops by. So grab a cup of tea, uh, sit back, and enjoy. All right, guys, welcome to another episode of the Tea with Mike show. Uh, joining me uh, for this one is uh, Gilbert, and today is extra special because it's also uh, Gilbert's uh, birthday. So <laughs> first off, welcome to Tea with Mike, Gilbert. Thanks for having me, Mike. And, and before, uh, before we start, yeah. uh, happy birthday. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, so again, welcome to the show. Let's, uh, what do you call home? What do I call home? Where do you uh, call home? Here, I'm in Edmonton, Edmonton, Alberta. Um, been here for quite a long time now. Fantastic. So let, let's start with how did you become involved uh, with uh, theatre as a child? My mom, um, she was a very gentle stage mother, and I started performing as a toddler and eventually got involved in some children's troops kind of a thing and uh, did some touring shows, and I just stayed with it locally with the community um, arts programs and so on and, and just continued to grow into it naturally. Fantastic. And so you kind of mentioned it a little bit, Was it, but was it uh, something that your um, family uh, encouraged and helped nurture your uh, love of theatre? Well, you know, I I just had a great love for it. And I really got, I would say, my footing probably in the early 70s uh, because of a, a, a teacher, uh, Robert J. Fix, who was a uh, great guy and saw something in me and really pushed me in the direction and then I just it just snowballed from there um I'm a U of A graduate you know so I decided to go and do the proper the proper training and that kind of thing so just to interject so you have your uh, BFA uh no I actually have a, a B ed from the U of A as a drama specialist which is kind of a defunct uh, major now they they stopped offering that I think in the nineties sometime. Right, yeah, because because I, I I know some uh, people in Edmonton, right? The more recently, but they have yeah taken the newer version, like the BFA. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. It, you know, it was a, a different era, different time, different needs in the community, and they wanted people that could actually train people to be high school drama teachers because there was a shortage of it. So um, oh, okay. kind of a thing going on. So very different era. Very... And, and, and so was, uh, obviously we're going to dive a lot deeper into this, but so as well as your uh, self, uh, any of your family's uh, regular performers and creative people? Um, my brother dabbles a, a lot in well, not so much theater anymore, but still does a bit of film. And uh, my three daughters have all had a, stuck their toes in the water. My oldest girl has done quite well with um, some acting and directing and that kind of thing. But right now they've all focused on careers and raising babies. And <laughs> so, the other part of life, right? Yeah, exactly. So they, they've gone after that. And, and myself, I haven't actually done theater for the last couple of years because I've just been so involved with production and with film that, and I can feel it clawing away at me that I have to get back to the stage and do something there. So, which um, obviously uh, COVID slowing uh, that ambition down, right? COVID, COVID has been so difficult for so many mediums. You know, theater being obvious, you know, the obvious one, dance. Um, but it's really impacted film and television production. Boy, I hope, fingers crossed, that this goes away pretty soon and everybody can get back to a, a more normal normal. Fantastic. So uh, let's uh, take it uh, back a little bit to uh, towards the, uh, the beginning of your career and um, uh, from uh, looking at your website and uh, little clips that I've watched. Uh, you're a very uh, talented actor. And if I'm reading things correctly, 
I, I believe, well, first off, you appeared in uh, lots of uh, productions and uh, you had uh, 22 uh, leading uh, roles in uh, various uh, productions. Um, out of all of those leading roles and a lot of that acting work, is there a particular one that stands out? Hmm. Tough question. You know, when you're doing them, you always, your focus is so intense that you think this is, this is you know, the one that will be my favorite. Um, I did C.S. Lewis in Shadowlands. Uh, I can't even remember when that was. Early 2000s, I guess, at the Casa Theater at the Jubilee Auditorium. And, and the reason that it really stands out is I ended up absolutely being in love with that role. And I hated it in the process. I didn't oh. like uh, finding C.S. Lewis. I, and I'm just being honest and, and open about this, but I really didn't like the character. And literally, um, at the dress rehearsal, you know, or after the dress rehearsal, I said to my wife, hmm, I wonder if it's too late for me to get out of this. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, well, you know, you're just, you're being insane. <laughs> and somehow opening night happened and it all clicked. And I went, I love this guy. Oh, wow. But all my research, all my reading, I was like, I, I liked everything he taught, everything he said, that kind of thing. But I wasn't finding him as a person. And and then it clicked. It all, all of the work had finally just gelled, which is unusual because usually I find a character and I, I and he, they gel much earlier in the process. So this was a weird, this was an anomaly. Interesting. And, and, and so many people that saw the show came to me and said, oh, man. Like, that's got to be your best. And I don't know if it was because it was a struggle. Um, it certainly had a great cast. Um, Valerie Howell played opposite me. Uh, Harvey Clark. There's a number of great people to work with. And they, it, the cast just gelled so nicely. You know, and it was a wonderful show. F fantastic. Do, 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 you think it, do you think it came to do, uh, together... Um, Differently because you didn't feel like at the time it, it was a character that you loved as much as maybe some of um, your brothers. Do you think because it, it, you had a different mindset and so you were almost going into it with kind of maybe less less pressure than you might typically put on you, yourself, and it resulted in, in, in an authentic and. Uh, different type of experience and people saw that from potentially people that have seen you in numerous uh, characters in multiple productions. It's, you know, I tried to analyze it and I think the struggle was a big part of it, was making it rich. I think when you find a character easily, um, you, you start to get lazy with it. You go, oh, I got this. And then you kind of, coast and and you know because it, it's just feels so natural the big part for me was i i couldn't identify with him until i found him and once he clicked then i could identify with him and i have huge respect for mr lewis but it was finding that thing how does he you know i i couldn't relate and and that's always tough for any actors if you cannot relate to who you're playing no matter who or what they are, you've got to find that. And until you do, um, you know, you end up playing yourself. You know? right. So maybe that was part of it. I think the struggle really helped. But I've had, I've been really fortunate in getting a lot of great roles and enjoyed them all. And you always think this is the, the best one, and then you get another one. And go, no, no, this is the best <laughs> one. You just keep jumping from that. Um, I think many, many, many years ago, I played uh, Romeo. Oh, yeah. And that one stands out, too, because it was not a fun experience. The young lady that was cast as Juliet and I did not get along at all. Oh, wow. And so we struggled. And people would say, oh, are you two a real couple? <laughs> you seem so much in love. And we couldn't stand each other, you know? And it was just that personality class so rehearsals were always difficult right. but you know you get through it 
and you think, oh, this has got to be my worst performance. And then yet people compliment you and say, well, oh, it was so genuine. I could feel the love. And you're thinking, really? Because <laughs> I wasn't, you know, but. Interesting. We'll, we'll, we'll probably never know, but it, it'd be interesting if if the casting director and the people involved on the production team thought about uh, if, uh, things like that for something like Romeo and Juliet, which is very divided and you know, very different characters and the monument. So the I, think, I think audiences would be really surprised to learn that how common it is for the lovers in the story to not necessarily be attracted or like each other or even get along sometimes, you know, but that's the job. Right. You make it work regardless of what your personal feelings are. Fantastic. And then, so do you think all of these uh, different types of experiences that you've uh, developed as an actor, um, do you think uh, they've helped you as you've kind of transitioned uh, down a uh, the producer and the director route a little more? Um, very much. I have huge sympathy for actors, regardless of what we ask them to do. You know, if we ask them to um, get punched in the face and fall down, you know, I know what it's like to, to do that. And, I, you know, I have way more empathy and way more sympathy for the fact that, yeah, okay, this you might get some bruises today or you might... You know, and we take all the pains we can to make sure they're not injured. But there's always something, you know, and and I sympathize with actors. I, I often have said I'll never I'll never ask an actor to do anything that I wouldn't do or right. that I've already done. And so, um, you know, so but I sympathize because I know how awkward it can be, you know, and, and I fallen into the casting situation where you've got two people that have to dance, for example, and one's a dancer, right. a legitimate dancer, and the other one says, well, I don't even dance socially, and I don't like it, and then they have to make it look absolutely flawless, and they struggle, and so I, I think it gives me an empathy that sometimes can be lacking with some other directors, for example, you know, where they just, they came up through a different route, and have never acted themselves, and they just don't know what it feels like. Awesome, and then uh, that, that actually naturally led to something else. I was going to ask, do you think uh, productions and shows are more natural, authentic, and engaging if uh, the production team, especially um, the people in my, the artistic director's role, well, while the director have a, a performance background, like they've been on stage as an actor, and have experienced some of the uh, different roles in different environments. I will upset some folks and maybe step on some toes with my answer, but um, I absolutely think that if you're going to direct actors, you have to have actors yourself. You just you can't fathom it the way a real experience is. And that's the same with dancing or anything else. It, you've got to have done something that is approximates what they've done. And, and I know that there's a, a real flavor today of people coming up through the, the technical route and understanding camera and lighting and all the technical elements, but never really act, you know, never really dealing with the whole acting process or understanding that process. And my bias, of course, is theater because that's where I got my start. So I understand that whole fundamental approach um, and that foundation. You know, I, I was in a conversation with someone else who was directing, and he, he said, I don't like to use theater actors because they're too big, they're too theatrical. You know, and he meant for in film. And I said, oh, well, that's just because you're not a good director. And of course, that starts the argument. Right? <laughs> but I really think that, you know, I've never had a situation where you can't take a theater actor and adapt them to film because they have the foundation and they have far greater training, you know, as a rule. And I even posed to a bunch of my university acting students, I offered, I said, I will pay $1,000 to any one of you 
that can tell me an actor that won the best actor award at the Academy who doesn't have theater. Interesting. And in 10 years, nobody climbed it. Oh, wow. Because all of the great actors start somewhere on the board. But that's where my bias lies, and other people have different opinions. And right. That's why we have so much variety in this arena. You know, there's not just one path. Right, because there's so many uh, different personalities and uh, backgrounds, right? Right. I mean, there's, we all have what works for us, and that even applies to actors. You know, one of, one of the things that I learned very early on was uh, I always say I don't mess with an actor's methods because, you know, if you attach yourself to one school of thought and you say, well, you've got to do it this way, mm, that may not work for that actor. So I let every, I, you know, I try to understand everybody's method and everybody's process. And I've had people say to me, well, you treat that person differently than you treat me. And I go, because their needs are different. Ah. So, you know, I have to tailor, I don't have one directing style. I have to tailor something different for each actor. Yeah. And these days I, I really focus on casting because there's an old, there's an old saying, um, if you cast well as a director, 90% of your job is done. So getting that casting right and getting those good people it makes things so much easier and, and that's something that you like genuinely like believing like getting the, the casting right whenever you can yeah, absolutely because if they if they're absolutely right for the role these are highly intelligent highly trained people they grasp it they're going to bring you better than you can imagine and so then your job becomes being a mirror you reflect it back to them and just, you know, help them tweak and help them stay in frame. And, and so then your job becomes less because they're giving you such great characterization. But if you've got somebody who's, for some reason, you've cast someone and they're not right, now you've got to almost teach them. You know, you've got to teach the acting to them to get it, the performance you need. So casting is key. Right, and uh, awesome. And then, so another thing you've also uh, done is say uh, you, you worked in uh, television at uh, CTV Edmonton and Global Edmonton in a whole bunch of roles, including uh, uh, producing and being involved in commercials. Um, how does uh, working in uh, television compare to working in theater? Uh, you would. There's probably more differences than similarities. Um, television is very structured and it's very time oriented, you know, down to the minute. Like when I when I teach my film students, I always say the six o'clock news starts at six o'clock. Right. Not six o one. It doesn't start one second late. It starts exactly at six o'clock. Right. Otherwise, um, you everything else out in the in the process, right? And nobody cares if you had a fight with your significant other five minutes before the camera rolls. You've still got to do your job no matter what's going on. So it's a different kind of a thing. Um, and, and these days, television has become uh, mostly a live experience. And it's mostly informative. You know, it's basically news now. You know, so and, and when I think of things like uh, production, that's more outside of television these days. You know, where we're seeing that evolution. At one time, television gave us ninety percent of our entertainment. Now it gives us um, what's created locally is our local news and local information, and all of the programming is brought in from the outside. You know, it's purchased rather than produced. So. Right. We've seen that change in the last few years, and so it, it's different. You know, uh, theater is theater is the pure form. You know, I I sometimes joke and say, uh, 
uh, theater is my religion, <laughs> you know, because it is a pure form of entertainment. And again, that that in-person, face-to-face, live, the curtain goes up, the lights, you know, come up. It's so magical, right? And now for the next two hours, whatever happens, happens. And it's out of everybody's control, you know. If an actor trips on the carpet and falls, that's part of the show now. I know. No one sells cuts. <laughs> yeah, so, so so I don't know if you know I can really li- uh, relate to uh, what you just said. Um, I had a strong act interest in acting uh, growing up uh, when I was living in England, and uh, so I performed on like Georgian uh, stages and always loved the ma- the magic and the adrenaline of uh, theatre. And then when I came. To Canada like seven years ago, I'm 24. Um, I took the uh, theater and entertainment uh, production program at the time at uh, Red Deer College and then I worked on the uh, technical side of theater for about uh, two and a half years and it's something that I've always enjoyed and just um, until COVID hit, <laughs> was back, back into it again, like volunteering. So I, I can definitely relate to the, the statement about theater in its purest forms and the adrenaline and the magic. Oh, absolutely. There's nothing that replaces it. And there's no greater high than a natural uh, standing ovation. Right. You know, they haven't invented the drug that, will, that gives you that feeling. You know? and, or even the feeling of um, going back to C.S. Lewis, it's, a, you know, it hits people in the heart, and it'd be something to be on stage, and out of the corner of your eye, you see all of these um, tissues and handkerchiefs coming out in the dark, these little white flags. <laughs> um, you can occasionally hear people sniffling and, and sobbing and that kind of thing. And, and it's the same with laughter. When you're doing a comedy, I did, I did um, The Odd Couple on that same stage, and I played opposite uh, Kelvin Beck. And the audience is so close, and they and when they get the big belly laughs, <laughs> feed off of that energy, and it becomes this relationship. You know, you you still maintain your relationship with your scene partner, but you're like, okay, you like that one? Well, here's another one. You know, right. and, and yeah. you play with the audience like that. And um, Kelvin, bless his little heart, he would try every night to crack. And he only he only got me once, you know, and there's nowhere to hide in that theater. So the audience knew that he had that he made me laugh and and I'm you know playing my head upstage and all of that kind of thing, trying to maintain composure. But the audience went wild. Once they knew that I had broken, they just their energy went up so high and they were roaring. Um, and then he starts to ad lib extra dialogue, which is not helping me regain my composure at all. And so you have those beautiful moments, and you don't get that in, say, film or, or television programming. Right, because it's more structured and rigid to a degree. Well, and you know, on a film set, you let it happen, everybody has a good laugh, you call cut, and then you do it all over again because that's not in the script. You know, right. so, you, so some of those beautiful moments. Uh, just the audience just doesn't get to enjoy because you're staying to the point. So fantastic. So I think I know know what you're going to say to this uh, next question, but do you, <laughs> <laughs> but I might be wrong. Uh, so do you do you prefer if you were picking one? Do you prefer uh, theater, uh, film, or television? Uh, I'd have to say to you. Phew, I was correct. <laughs> I would have to say theater. It's, like I said, it's pure form. It's the real thing, you know, and that is my bias. Um, I love film. I love the fact that you can see the exact same story over and over again. You know, I have films that I've watched 20 times. Casablanca, for example. Um, and you can study it and you can find nuance that you missed the first time. So I love that. Uh, television, because of series work, you get to go on a lifelong journey, you know, uh, with 
with some of those characters. I remember a series called MASH um, and its final episode. You know, I'm fighting back tears and I'm going, this is a TV show. It's not, none of this is real. And these people are actors. I know all that. But you had invested so much in them and their, their journey that they felt like family and now it was over. It was almost like, it was almost like a death in the family, you know? And so, so there's wonderful things about all media. Um, they all serve their purpose. They all do different things for different people. Um, I love being on set. I love working with actors. I like, like say with film, I like the camaraderie of the crew. And I have a very organic style in film and I go in with a plan and I know exactly what I want. And then at the last minute, I'll see something and I'll make a change. And then maybe the director of photography will make a suggestion. And then I'll picture that suggestion and then, okay, let's change that. You know, so I like that. And I like the, being able to tweak it in, in the edit suite. And, and do the post work and go, you know, we can change this. We can alter that. I like, always thought that line was kind of dumb. Let's just cut it out. So that's nice. You never get to go back and revisit a performance in theater, you know, because it's that magic moment and it's gone, like a puff of smoke. So that's the difference. And, and I enjoy all the different sides of it. But there's an energy in theater that you just don't get in anything else. Right. Very true. Awesome. Uh, and then so uh, the, uh, the tea fact uh, for the episode is uh, peppermint tea is believed to help ease uh, digestive issues and, it, and relieve uh, tension, headaches and uh, migraines. And this comes from uh, healthline.com. Mm. Yes. So uh, the reason, so I always enjoy uh, learning uh, more about uh, tea because it's something I, I'm kind of passionate about, but partly because of my cultural roots being from England. So, so it's always fascinating to uh, dive deeper beyond the word tea and see where it all originated from and which, which places grow the tea and a little bit about the process on how they make tea, o almost like theater, film and television. They all have like processes more than what you see on the screen. I've often thought about the first people to try things. And I'm wondering, you know, there's a guy with, a, with some boiling water who says, I'm going to take this plant and put it in here and see what happens. And then we're going to drink the result. You know, like, how did they arrive at that? And I know that there are great tea connoisseurs in the world. I'm not one of them, though. If you saw our tea collection, I, you'd be... Surprised if you have so much, I think. <laughs> Fantastic. I'm, I've always wondered about the first person who said, you know, with everything, um, oh, look at this plant. Let's roll it up and smoke it and see what happens. Like, how do you come to that conclusion to be the first guy to try this stuff? And even more so, I mean, there's certain teas that have huge medicinal properties. And how did someone say, wait, this person's sick with this ailment. Let's make a tea for it. And how do they know? You know, like it's one thing to have the information passed on generation to generation and say, "Oh, chamomile tea will help you sleep." Well, you didn't figure that out. Somebody two, three, four, five hundred years ago figured that out. Yes. So, who's the courageous soul that goes, "What happens if we put this in water?" And now let's drink it. You know, <laughs> hemlock looks good. It, yeah, no, it's a, a, a very true. <laughs> uh, so, so when you, so when you uh, bio, uh, you, uh, you said your your vision must be for the sake of the audience. The story must touch the heart and the head and be universal. The team must be unified in that vision. So, can you uh, explain a little bit exactly what you mean by that? Oh, absolutely. Um... You know, I learned it from a much wiser fellow who said, humanity sat around campfires for centuries, and some clever fellow entertained everybody before bedtime by just telling a story. And the great orators told the best stories and the loved and 
and it created a vision and it carried on traditions and many, 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 many other things like that. So I think it's very selfish when artists indulge themselves. I think that whether it's television, film, radio, the stage, it's all about the audience. I am conveying and telling the story to the audience, and that should be your primary objective, and it should be for their benefit, for their joy, for their escapism, whatever. So that's where your um, your focus absolutely has to be. And the team, your creative team, has to buy into that director's vision. Right? This is the story we're going to tell, and this is how we're going to tell it. And it doesn't work if you have people on the team that go, no, no, I think Hamlet should live. You know? Yeah. And you start to pull apart at that. You have to be unified. Everybody has to be on board. And we should all be sacrificing for the sake of that story because we want to take that audience on a, on a journey. There's an American actor I worked with in, um, in the 70s who said, Every audience, no matter where they are, it doesn't matter what city, whether it's New York, Edmonton, or Saskatoon, it doesn't matter. These people have worked hard all day, and they have taken some of their money, and they allow you the great honor of entertaining them and edifying them and educating them. And so it's really all about the experience they get. They're the important ones not us, the creators of it. And so I, I, I believe that. I think a lot of people are very self-indulgent with their creation. And, it's, and I want to say, whoa, slow down. Slow down. Who are you doing this for? Are you doing it for yourself? Or are you doing it for the audience? Because they're, I mean, without the audience, you're performing to the wind. <laughs> very, 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 uh, very true. And is, is this a is this a vision that you've like, always had, or is it something that you've kind of formulated and uh, developed more as you've uh, gained uh, more experience in all of the different roles that you've uh, done today? I think as, as we age and as we mature, we get away from self more and more. I think experience does that. Um, I think it's encounters with audience members, either right after the show or sometimes it's months later and you bump into somebody and they go, hey, weren't you King Lear? Oh, you touched me. And then you realize, wow, I've impacted this life insurance or whatever, you know? And, and that's our job is to impact them. I mean, I have done some some shows that have been uh, maybe politically charged and or brought a social justice element into it. And people have said, you know, uh, I couldn't sleep after seeing that show, after that play. I, I couldn't sleep. I was thinking about it. Yeah, you know, it, it really made me rethink some things. And that's our job as well, you know, is to is to get people to think and talk in an uncensored environment, in a safe but uncensored environment. Explore, explore every avenue that there is out there, and uh, you know, and then allow people to make their own choices and decisions. Emotion has the greatest impact. Um, you know, right now where we are as a society, we're looking at um, racial tensions and racial issues. And I believe very strongly that the film um, 12 Years a Slave had phenomenal impact on people because it put them in an empathetic position to go, this is so unjust. When you identify with the main character and many of the characters in, in the film, you identify with them and you go, wait, this is so un unjust. Something's got to be done. Well, the story is 150 years old. Things have been done. But 
once it impacts you emotionally, uh, then people are motivated to do something or to make change or whatever. Intellect only tends not to trigger people acting upon it. They can understand it and go, yep, I agree. Yep, yep, that's a bad situation. But when you impact them emotionally, they'll do something. They'll react. So. Awesome. And then so, so then how do you take that vision? Because it's, it's kind of, it's, it's obvious that, especially in creativity, there's a lot of uh, differing opinions and style. So, so, yeah, how do you inspire people um, to see your, your vision, especially often in the role as director, who is ultimately is guiding the vision of the show or project? I try to be honest and transparent. And I try also to be pragmatic. You know, there's some things that you are not going to be able to achieve. I also think that when you empower people to help you, and empowering people, the more you empower people, the more they want to they want to help you. But you know, really, it always comes back to the script. Whatever script you've got, you know, is going to um, affect things. I mean, if you have to do a car commercial, and I've done many, many <laughs> commercials, um, that's not a great social challenge, you know. Um, if you're doing a horror slasher type movie, not a lot of great social redeeming value in there. But still, the process is the same. You need people to buy into audiences want to escape with this and have people commit to it. You know, people on your team have to commit to it. So the process remains the same. Sometimes the payoff and rewards aren't as uh, aren't as obvious maybe as they are in some other things. We're, we're doing a film now. We go back into production next week, which is a family drama uh, based on the true story. And everybody on the crew has really bought into this story. It's a very touching story. And so um, yeah, people are pretty you know, excited and they like the direction that I'm going in, at least so far. We'll see what happens in the next few weeks. Um, but they really have embraced it, and I'm excited. I'm excited to get back to work on it. Fantastic. And, and so that's a nice little transition into, as a director, you've directed numerous films, including Core Values, uh, No Apology, Cat's Cradle, uh, Winter Kill, Halo, Unfinished Business, Green Eyes, and The Zombie Apocalypse, an apartment at 19, oh, sorry, 14F, and also had a hand in uh, producing uh, lots of these uh, projects. Uh, so, and then also more recently, a uh, line producer for John 316, uh, which was nominated for Best Canadian uh, Feature 2020 at the Hollywood North Film Awards. So there's, there's a lot of different uh, projects uh, that you've worked on. How do you decide what scripts you want to work on as a director and also as a producer? Um. To be honest, it's there has to be commercial value. Well, and and the commercial value is going to be set by the people who put the money into the film. I mean, they've got to identify that there's commercial value. So you don't always you you don't always get a lot of choices. You know, someone along the path says this is going to be great. This is going to make money. Uh, I want I want to put money into this because I'm hoping to make a profit in this kind of film. And so, you know, I'll be honest. A lot of times it's not choice. It's opportunity. It's what's presented, you know. Um, the story that we're doing right now, Connecting Flights, was brought to me by someone who said, listen, we've got the budget in place. We want to adapt this stage play to the screen. Can you, you know, get the right screenwriter for it? I read the play and went, oh, I want to do the play. I, I love this story. It does have commercial value. It's also a niche film. It's not necessarily mainstream, but it's very much a niche film. And yet I fell in love with the story. So I, I pounced on that one. Other times it's just opportunity. It's, we're doing this and we're willing to pay you that. 
and do you want to work? And you, you know, I am way more creative on a full stomach, so <laughs> I often react to the check, you know, um, and then you embrace it. After you've made that decision, you embrace it. But the, the thing with film is, for the most part, certainly at, at a feature film length level, it's it's all about commercial value. Someone has to believe that we're going to make money with it. And then the art falls into place after it. Um, and we have our bucket list kind of stories that we want to do, you know, and you wonder, are we, you know, will I ever get to tell that story? Core Values was a story that I dreamed of. Um, and it, what impacted me was a number of news articles and news stories that were coming on. And I had this idea, and I, and I saw a common theme about things can happen because people believe in these things happen, you know? And, uh, and, it, and we may go through life and not realize that there's things happening behind the scenes. And I went to several writers, and no one could give me a script that I was happy with. And then I took it to Brandon Rhymes, and I think we were on the fourth or fifth draft when I went, okay, wait a minute. You've come up with a story that's close to what I was thinking, and I like where it's going. Let's shoot that one. And then Morgan LeBlanc and I went out and we found the money for it, and the rest, as they say, is history. But it was a story I just, it, it was just an idea that I thought people should take a few minutes to think about, you know, because um, no one really does. And that, that, and that also uh, highlights um, something quite important. Sometimes a you have to give a little bit and also to, to take a little bit. There has to be a little bit of uh, flexibility in, in the process and sometimes not getting hung up on on one idea, but that flexibility and that adapt adaptation. Otherwise, you can end up with 62 great ideas, but nobody ever gets to see any of those ideas because you weren't willing to budge a little bit. Well, you know, one of my favorite sayings is, it takes a village to raise a film. And so people will say, oh, Gil, you did a great job making core values. And I think, mm, no, 107 people did a great job of making this film. And it starts with the writer and it starts with, uh, you know, the, the financial partners, the, the executive producers, and it just keeps going down the line. And it takes absolutely everybody that you associate with and it doesn't end there then you've got distribution the, this film world you realize very quickly you're one tiny cog in a massive machine so you know, I, i'm always really pleased when people acknowledge my participation but i also recognize i'm very humbled by the fact that no you can't do this on your own you know, there's just too many pieces. So, and we are fortunate that there's a lot of really creative and talented people in our community to draw on, to get involved with them. So, and people with great passion for the arts here. Uh, and I think a lot of Edmontonians, for example, when it comes to theater, they don't realize what a powerhouse Edmonton is in the theater world. You know, that we've got a legacy that, that we're known outside of outside of our community. We produce an amazing thing. And exactly. film, film as well. Yeah, exactly. You you just uh, you just have to look at some of the things that Edmonton has going on, like in the theater world, like the Edmonton Fringe, right? The second largest fringe festival in the world with over a hundred thousand people attending from all the way around the world, people coming to volunteer from Australia and all these crazy places and all the street performers and then all the local uh, home, homegrown talent, which uh, really gives it a, a, a strong uh, kind of like balance. And then also on the on, on the film side and how every week in the summer there's a, there's a different festival happening in Edmonton, right? 
Edmonton has a great legacy. I don't think we promote it enough. One of my pet peeves about Canadians in general is we don't we don't promote. There's an old joke. Um, a U.S. celebrity needs a bodyguard. A Canadian celebrity needs a name tag. <laughs> and that's because we don't we don't promote the way they do, and we don't hold up our people. Uh, as icons and, and that kind of thing, but we really should. We have such a such a legacy here for achieving so many great things, in, especially in the world of art and entertainment. Um, and I just think we should be way more boastful about all the wonderful things we do. So, I'm off the soapbox. Yeah. Now I don't know too much about it on this side, but are there any? Um almost like c committees of creative um, Canadian uh, talent uh, that are trying to uh, work together to uh, take Canadian uh, white pro projects and entertainment to, to a wider distribution level? Um, well, in terms of film, in terms of television, certainly, you know, there's, there's avenues, but really most Canadians that are trying to get a, you know, into the global market end up going to a U.S. distributor. I mean, we, that's what we do. Um, we don't actually have a Canadian distributor. That All right. we, we talk to, but we don't necessarily work with, well, you know, I guess we've moved. Well, I'm making a liar out of myself here because, yeah, we actually have uh, used the Canadian branch of an American company to All put right. core values into Sunrise record stores across the country. Oh, that's cool. So we are involved with, with actual Canadian businesses. Um, you know, I think I think just some other people just do so much more promoting of self. You know, like I mean, if you win. Uh, a Gemini in Canada, people go, oh, that's nice. He's such a friendly fellow, and that's it. Moving on. But some girl in the States wins Miss Idaho Potato, and right. they turn her into the biggest thing in the world. You know, and it's like, well, okay. They just know how to promote that stuff. And we're just so polite, and, and so I'm assuming that it actually hurts us in terms of that part of thing. You know? Yeah, so, so so on the on the top on the on the on the top level, we we do, we do kind of need more like like promotion of uh, Canadian talent. Well, one of the well, I'm stepping on a lot of toes. <laughs> um, one of the things about Canadian talent is we don't recognize someone's ability until they have success in the United States. Okay. And then, then we do that thing. We say, oh, Mike Myers, he's good. But it's because he's achieved in the United States. But he was good before he went there. You know, Jim Carrey and Michael J. Fox. When you achieve there, you know, then we recognize, oh, yes, you're, you're a talented Canadian. We need to do a lot more of that here at home and say, hey, you've done well locally and you're good. And promote them. So, again, I'm on a soapbox today. What is it? Oh, it's because I'm older. That's it. I, I got older today. Making me think. Yeah, for sure. And then, so I, I understand that a uh, kind of a, another important uh, component of your work is um, involving uh, the, the community uh, in, in, in a project. So, can you tell us a little bit? about how exactly you involve community in uh, some, some, some of the work that you do, and even Alberta and uh, ta talent too, because I know it, that's my from. It depends on the project, on um, what the approach is. Um, I, you know, I'll, I'll sidetrack a little bit and try and get back, so you may have to pull me back. Um, I hear a lot of flack about, you know, millennials and that kind of thing. Well, I work with an awful lot of, uh, young people who fall in the millennial category, I gotta say they're great. You know, they work hard, they have great work ethics, they have great ideas, they're really creative. And I think for 
the boomers that have, like myself, that have been around here forever and doing it, it's our duty to pass the history to them and it's our duty to mentor them. And there's a big difference between um, directing them and mentoring them. Mentoring them is letting them find their path and helping them to find their path. So I'm always aware of that. And I love to see this young talent develop and get some breaks and, and move forward. Um, I, I like to scour the province and as Morgan does and, and Ian and Joanne and my other partners, Dean, we like to look around the province and see who's doing what and how great they are and can we get them involved. So our crews, you know, are, come from all over the province, sometimes outside the province when we hear about somebody. Um, the same with the acting talk. Like we, we try and get people involved. We uh, we shot core values in the Red Deer area. Uh, you know, we shot Southern Lake or Corn, you know, and around. So it's somewhere in the county on some farms and things. And it was really exciting because the people enjoyed having it. You know, it was a novelty to have somebody come from Edmonton and take on a project. And then we involved those people. And, uh, and they loved it. So it was great. It helps, to, it helps to unify everybody in the province, but at the same time, it provides opportunities that they might not have seen otherwise. I hope that helps. No, 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 that, that's good. So you, so you're trying to help mentor uh, the next generation for opportunities, trying to get the, like, Alberta involved and provide opportunities to different people on d different levels, however that uh, may look. So that's fantastic. As it's, it's, best we can anyway, you know. And can uh, the wider Canada, yes. So, so I know you're very busy all the time, like being creative. So, what do you like to do to relax? What is that relax? What is that thing? <laughs> um, you know, uh, with family, and you know, I've got uh, four grandchildren now. So I actually spend time with family and play with the grandkids. I always say, you know, if I knew how much fun grandchildren were, I would have had them first. <laughs> But uh, no, they, uh, it's a lot of family stuff. And one of my ways to relax is to go to the theater and shut my, shut my professional side off or go to the cineplex and, sh and just get lost in the story, you know, and try and recapture those things from childhood where you just saw it as magic. Um, and I still relax even when the business side comes up. Like, oh, that was a bad edit. You know, or ah, they should have done this differently, or they missed that, or you know, even that can be somewhat relaxing because you know it's kind of fun to find those things. So I love to get lost in the story. And, yeah. okay. and since I, uh, I sustained an injury uh, in the spring of 2017, and um, it's caused me to give up my motorcycle, which was my primary way to relax. I used to call it chrome therapy. And all my stresses would disappear just by getting on the motorcycle and going for a ride. So these days I'm in a four wheeler doing the same thing. Fantastic. So uh, as we come to at uh, the end of the show, is there a piece of advice that you've learned through all of the different um, av avenues like television, uh, film and theater that you uh, want to leave people with? Um, we're in a paradigm shift in the arts world. Everything is changing. Everything. How we do it, who we do it with, what we're doing, there's a big, big paradigm shift. And my advice to people is hang on to your vision. Remember your integrity. Um, be true to your story. And it'll all work out. Beautiful. Well, uh, uh, thank you uh, for being on the show today. 
Oh, thank you, Mike. This was great. This was uh, absolutely fun. Awesome, and, and, and again, happy birthday. Thank you so much. No problem. All right, guys, you'll be able to uh, watch this episode of the show uh, with Gilbert at uh, teawithmike.com. So thank you again. Thank you. Appreciate it, Mike. It's the Tea with Mike show.